Uh, it's like we've forgotten who we are, Dom. Explorers, pioneers, not caretakers. What's up, everyone? It's Ryan here from The Y, and today we're going to be taking a look at my favorite space travel movie of all time, Interstellar. Man, what an incredible film. I remember watching the IMAX version when it came out in 2014, and just being in awe of what i just seen. Few movies, if any, have ever matched that cinematic experience for me. So, in saying that, here it is. 30 Facts You Didn't Know About Interstellar The earliest origins of Interstellar can be traced back to Carl Sagan and him setting up two friends on a blind date in the year 1980. Those two people were producer Linda Obst and theoretical physicist Kip Thorne. And although their romance never really took off, a friendship was started which eventually led to the conception of Interstellar in 2005. A year later, the idea attracted the attention of Steven Spielberg, who then hired Jonathan Nolan to write the screenplay for the movie. But in 2011, after Spielberg moved his production studio to Walt Disney, Paramount needed a new director for Interstellar. Jonathan suggested his brother Christopher Nolan direct it, and the rest is history. Jonathan Nolan spent four years writing the script for Interstellar, even going so far as to study relativity at the California Institute of Technology. He said that two of the major influences for the film came from WALL-E and Avatar. Another piece of inspiration came when Jonathan got to meet Elon Musk. Their meeting spawned the idea of NASA operating covertly in the future without major backing from the government. Christopher Nolan also worked for years on his own script for Interstellar, ultimately merging his brother's script with his own, creating the movie that we know today. The first hour of the movie, which provides the setting and backdrop for the film, was largely from Jonathan's mind, while the second half of the movie is mainly Christopher's. The space station endurance closely resembles that of a clock, with each box module representing one hour. Time is a major theme in the movie, so it's no surprise they made the spacecraft a symbol of that fact. The cornfield in the movie was actually real. Nolan learned from Zack Snyder and his work on Man of Steel that growing it was feasible. So instead of using digital effects, they grew 500 acres of corn and even sold it for a profit. Dr. Kip Thorne the lead theoretical physicist for the movie said that probably the largest degree of creative liberty taken in the film are the ice clouds present on Dr. Man's planet. Thorne said that he cringes every time at that part because the structures go beyond what the material strength of ice would be able to support. But if that's the most egregious error in a movie about wormholes, black holes, and transcending space and time, then who really cares about some ice clouds? Old Murph has both the first and last lines of the movie. Oh my, that was a farmer. I'm like everybody else back then. By the light of our new sun in our new home. The visual effects that portray rays of light stretching out over the horizon of the black hole is a real phenomenon called gravitational lensing. This basically means that the gravitational force of the black hole is so strong that it bends light out around its sphere or event horizon. In April 2019, the first images of a black hole were discovered and released to the public. And crazy enough, it looks almost identical to the one in Interstellar. Interstellar was the fifth collaboration between Hans Zimmer and Christopher Nolan. Nolan believes that this is the most powerful and compelling soundtrack that Zimmer has ever created. Well, I wrote this piece really about what it feels like to be a father and what it feels like to have a son, and I was writing about my son. During the atmospheric entry to the water planet, Cooper makes a very interesting statement. Should I disable the feedback? No. I need to feel the air. So, this probably doesn't mean all that much to you unless you're a pilot of some sort. 
but it's actually a reference to the common aviation phrase, fly by the seat of your pants. This expression came about in the early days of flight when there were few navigation aids and everything was accomplished by means of the pilot's judgment. This is why the camera focuses specifically on Cooper holding his seat multiple times in the scene. It's done on purpose because doing so would allow a person to feel the vibrations coming off the seat, which they can then use to determine wind speed and direction. After the crew lands on the water planet, right before they are about to leave the vessel, the music softens and you can hear a quiet tick every one and a half seconds. Each of those ticks represent about 17 hours on Earth. While filming the scene in the water, somebody forgot to fully secure Anne Hathaway's suit and she got hypothermia as a result. The experience itself got pretty terrifying for Hathaway because she didn't tell anyone she was dying for fear of losing her job. As she put it, wimps do not last long on Nolan's set. Matt Damon was not included in any of the promos for the film and didn't even attend the premiere of the movie. There was one Variety article that disclosed he had some sort of unspecified role, but I think most of us were a little shocked to see him in the movie. If you wanted to learn a little more about Dr. Mann and his backstory, then you'll be glad to learn that there's a prequel comic that goes over just that. It's called Absolute Zero, and was written by Christopher Nolan and published on Wire Magazine's site. For Timothy Chalamet, Interstellar was a good learning experience about acting and how little control you have aside from playing your part sometimes. After seeing the film for the first time at a private screening for the cast, Chalamet went home with his dad and cried for about an hour, all because he thought his part in the movie was more significant. Chalamet said that although none of his scenes were exactly cut, for the long video monologue he recorded for his dad while in space, his face was never included as they went with a long zoom of McConaughey's reaction instead. The line, Do not go gentle into that good night, is a line from a poem written by Dylan Thomas. It means to live boldly and face death head on in a blaze of defiance, which is why the line fits so perfectly into one of the major themes of Interstellar. Interstellar is the longest IMAX presentation ever at two hours, 47 minutes, and seven seconds. And why is that specific time important? Well, for a while, the limit on IMAX films was two hours and 30 minutes, because the diameter of the platter dictated how long films could be on IMAX. But when James Cameron's Avatar was set to be released, he demanded more, and engineers accommodated him by moving the clamp system from the bottom to the top, thereby allowing film to wrap around the outermost edge, giving a little more runtime. Avatar clocked in at 2 hours, 46 minutes, and 54 seconds, which means that Interstellar beat its IMAX record by a mere 13 seconds. Christopher Nolan's first meeting with Matthew McConaughey was a little strange to say the least, and very unexpected. The two didn't talk one bit about Interstellar, even though they spoke for over three hours. Instead, they discussed what it meant to be 43-year-old men, who they were as fathers, and of course, their kids. So when I walked out of there, I, I had a little bit of, okay, well, what was that? <laughs> I enjoyed it. The jacket that adult Murph wears for the majority of the movie is almost identical to the one her dad has on in the beginning of the film. The only difference being that Murph's coat is a little longer and has patch pockets, while Cooper's has belt pockets. Seeing as Christopher Nolan was such a huge fan of Stanley Kubrick that he restored his film 2001 A Space Odyssey, it's no surprise that Interstellar contains many references and similarities to the iconic movie. One major callback was the placement of the wormhole next to Saturn, as this was originally 
the final destination of the Discovery mission in 2001 A Space Odyssey. However, it never panned out as the VFX at that time could not make a convincing rendition of Saturn's rings. Another reference are the robots Tars and Case, which have a striking resemblance to the obelisks in Kubrick's masterpiece. And finally, the video calls between Coop and his kids are an obvious shout out to 2001 A Space Odyssey. The explanation of the wormhole using the pen and paper is done exactly the same way in Event Horizon. When the spacecraft passes through the gateway, space returns to normal. During early production of the film, Kip Thorne laid out two ground rules that he wanted Nolan to follow for the movie. That nothing would violate established physical laws and any ideas or shots in the dark would originate from science rather than from the creative mind of the director. Nolan agreed to these rules as he wanted the film's foundations to be grounded in science. Although, this did not prevent arguments from taking place between the two. At one point, they debated for two weeks about traveling faster than the speed of light, with Nolan finally relenting and abandoning the idea. The TARS robot in Interstellar was actually a 200-pound puppet made of metal. In the movie, Anne Hathaway's character is named Amelia. This is almost certainly a callback to Amelia Earhart, as both women went further and explored more than any woman at that time. Jessica Lange was offered the role of Old Murph, but had to turn it down because of commitments to American Horror Story. Interstellar is the highest ranking box office hit from 2014 on IMDb. The visual representations of the wormhole and black hole in Interstellar was literally done as scientifically as possible. Dr. Kip Thorne worked alongside the visual effects team at Double Negative and provided pages of theoretical equations which they then used to create an entirely new CGI software that would be able to accurately render computer simulations of these phenomena. Amazingly, some individual frames took up to 100 hours to render, and the final product came out to a whopping 800 terabytes of data. It was also so scientifically accurate that it led to Thorne writing two scientific papers, one for astrophysics and one for computer graphics, and led to new insights into the effects of gravitational lensing and accretion disks around black holes. The books on Murph's bookshelf were all put there by design. They all hold some special meaning to the movie, its many themes, or to Nolan himself. Christopher Nolan commented on some of these books and explained their significance. The Wasp Factory by Ian Banks, Once Read, Never Forgotten, Strangely Moving, Horrible Tale of a Child and Father Living in Near Isolation, Gravity's Rainbow by Thomas Pincone, the most elegant title ever. Emma by Jane Austen, a beautiful name for a beautiful book or a beautiful producer. A Wrinkle in Time by Madeline Engel, my introduction to the idea of higher dimensions, including the notion of a tesseract. The Stand by Stephen King, a bleak scenario that hammers home the fact that our perspective on momentous events will always be intimate. Labyrinths by Jorge Luis Borges. The name says it all. Finally, We Were the Mulvaney's by Joyce Carol Oates is an interesting one because Nolan talks about this book and specifically the painting Krishna's world as the main influence for the setting of the farmhouse. The 2008 script written by Jonathan Nolan was much different than how the movie actually turned out. So I'm going to go over the major plot points because I just find it so fascinating that this is what Interstellar could have been. The start of the 08 version is largely the same, except that the beginning features a sequence showing the creation of the wormhole in the sun's solar system. And the drone they find is not Indian, but Chinese. Additionally, in the early script, NASA is located off the coast of Los Angeles on Santa Cruz Island, 
and Cooper is led there by a drone instead of by dust patterns. This is where things become wildly different. After going through the wormhole, they discover a solar system with two black holes orbiting one another. The crew is able to navigate between the black holes, eventually landing on the ice planet, but not before TARS is lost. After arriving on the ice planet, they discover that the Chinese had gotten there first, as evidenced by their base. But they soon come upon the graves of all the Chinese astronauts and learn that the culprit is a neutron star that emits powerful radiation every 24 hours. They go inside the shelter before the star returns and Case drills a hole in the ice which leads them deep underground. There, they unearth alien life in the walls and after trying to take a sample, it gets pissed off and a chase scene ensues. After, still underground, the team discovers a Chinese bunker which was supposed to house all the Chinese astronauts, but because none of them survived, all that is left are Chinese robots. While in the bunker, they discover a black box which creates gravity and decide to keep it, but in doing so, anger the Chinese robots and there's another chase scene. At this point, the team learn of another emergency related to the planet's orbit destabilizing. So, they get in their spacecraft and leave, only to fly too close to one of the black holes and they get sucked in. Decades pass by as minutes, and then suddenly, a wormhole opens up inside the black hole, which transports them to a gigantic space station built by the Chinese robots over the course of the last 4,000 years. At the futuristic space station, they have invented a wormhole network and TARS is also shown to have been found. Amelia elects to take TARS and explore the galaxy through the wormhole network, whereas Coop and Doyle feel the need to go back in time using the new technologies. They soon learn that time travel is possible, just not for humans. But this doesn't phase Doyle, as he'd already made his mind up. He locks Cooper away so he doesn't stop him, and travels through the wormhole by himself, which instantly kills him, but the black box survives and falls to the location where Cooper finds it in the beginning of the film. It's then shown that Coop's youngest son Murph, yes, Murph is the son, not the daughter, in the 08 version. So he finds the black box and spends 20 years attempting to solve it. He never succeeds, but his daughter Emily does, thus saving the human race. Cooper returns to Earth 200 years after he'd originally left to find it an icy wasteland. He goes back to his house and remains to die, eventually falling unconscious. And just like in the final version of the film, Coop wakes up on the space station and this time he has a hero's welcome. He meets his great 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 grandson Anthony Cooper Welling, who returns the watch he gave to Murphy centuries ago. An unspecified amount of time passes, upon which Cooper decides to go find Brand, like he promised her. A sequel to Interstellar is reportedly in early development at Warner Bros, and they want Nolan to reprise his role as director, or at least have a part in the screenwriting process. The film would be a direct sequel picking up right where it left off as Cooper chases after Brand on the far away but supposedly habitable planet. I for one think Interstellar was perfect as a standalone film, and a sequel is definitely not needed, but in saying that, take my money because I'm definitely getting tickets for the release of that movie. So what do you guys think about an Interstellar 2? Thank you all so much for watching, give me a like if you enjoyed the video, and subscribe if you haven't done that already. Alright, have a great day everyone, I'll see you all next time.